Hello and welcome to Here for Africa, a program that shall be coming to you on CNBC Africa every month, tackling various issues of development on the continent. My name is Charles Gitonga. As Africans, the way we interact with money has changed over the years. We don't bank the same way we used to do, pay for goods and services as we did, or even sending money to our friends and family. And that has been made possible by rise of technology, or what has come to be known as fintech. And that is the focus of this episode. In any given day in Nairobi, Kenya, you'll find people going about their businesses, and this includes popping into mobile money agents to deposit, send or withdraw cash. Kenya's adoption of mobile wallets has become a model for other African countries since the invention of M-Pesa by Safaricom 10 years ago. Whenever I, I talk about innovation, I always talk about innovation which meets a need. And the need was very well defined, actually, which was how do you move money from an urban district to a rural district? And M-Pesa came along and it fulfilled that need initially. Uh, but then what it did is it, it highlighted the fact that so many Kenyans were excluded from the f even rudimentary financial services. Uh, so that then went on to find more efficient ways of paying for things, uh, more efficient ways of saving, more efficient ways of borrowing. Having become a success story in Kenya, M-Pesa is also enjoying global recognition. I have traveled in you know, different parts of Africa, all over the place, and particularly in Kenya in, in, in interiors. You go to a small city, you will see uh, a, a Safaricom shop or you'll see an agent of a Safaricom shop who will be uh, giving out uh, M-Pesa as a wallet uh, capability in the phone and uh, topping it up and allowing customers to pay cash, withdraw cash, store value and transfer. And what else do you want? I mean, that's the tremendous uh, uh, sort of progress that they made. And actually, everything started from there on. And M-Pesa is a, is a classic case study which sort of almost triggered uh, a, a huge change across Africa. The mobile phone has become central to the financial system and it's at the heart of financial technology and inclusion in Africa. According to the World Bank, at least 64 million adults in Sub-Saharan Africa have mobile money accounts. In 2006, uh, we had something like 26% uh, of uh, population included in form of financial services. And uh, today now, it is something like 75%. The mobile phone has been truly revolutionary or has revolutionized the way we do business in the financial area in Kenya and some of the sub-Saharan Africa. For instance, the penetration rate of mobile phones is something like 88% in Kenya. While the mobile money technology has played a leading role in enhancing penetration of financial services, banks are continually changing their business models to accommodate the high demand for convenience by customers. There has certainly been uh, in, uh, some sort of uh, acceptance and also change of their business practices to incorporate digital financial services. And this does not just mean having a new app um, that uh, maybe customers can access and so forth. No, they have, uh, for instance, some of them are providing micro lending loans uh, to customers 24-7 uh, and, uh, and you can actually get uh, loans at whatever time you want. Um, this is truly, um, I think, uh, revolutionary. As you know, the traditional model of banking that we had was the bricks and mortar model where essentially as a customer you had to come to a bank uh, to get access to financial services. Over time we've seen that evolve uh, with the um, introduction of automatic teller machines, for instance ATMs, uh, with things like point of sales terminals. Uh, it became a lot more convenient for customers to be able to interact with their banks. In the case of Standard Chartered Bank, an investment worth $1.5 billion is underway to establish a digital identity through a strategy called Digital by Design. Uh, part of that investment that was done at global level, the impact that it has had on us here in Kenya is the, in, you know, the refreshment of our, of our online banking platform uh, that has now been completely redesigned. Uh, it's much, much more uh, user-friendly and very convenient. Uh, we also launched the uh, SC Mobile, 
uh, which is an app that you can download. And again, it provides a range of services uh, conveniently on your mobile phone. We also launched the retail workbench, which is really a tool for frontline staff to engage clients. And recently, we also launched uh, video banking, uh, which again means that you know you can actually have a video conference uh, call with a with a relationship manager with somebody in the bank and actually transact uh, you know seamlessly. The biggest impact of digitization and innovation is definitely being felt in the banking halls and today the queues are much shorter and when you talk to the leaders in the industry they'll tell you that banking is no longer a place you go but something you do from anywhere and anytime. When we say end-to-end -end digital bank it's not only talk about onboarding customers on a mobile phone, but ability to uh, actually close everything, including the back end, without uh, anybody running around with a piece of paper. So what we call it is mobile first and zero touch. So that's the kind of concept that we are trying to implement in Cote d'Ivoire, which is a very small market at this point in time. We have a very limited presence. But the reality is after that we will see roll it out across whole of Africa. That will change the way we bank completely uh, at this point in time. What it will also do, it will be a great opportunity for us to participate in a market in a much wider way. So historically our participation or any bank's participation for that matter is linked to how many branches do you have. Beyond banking, fintech continues to influence other industries such as payments, diaspora remittances, and lending. According to a fintech startup report of 2017 by Disrupt Africa, payments and remittances account for 41.5% of activity in Africa's top three fintech markets. These are South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. Of the 301 fintech startups in Africa, 125 of them are seeking to disrupt the payments market. We've only been around for a year. It's very hard for most people to understand that. And, um, and we've processed already you know, $1.5 billion in transactions across uh, 14 million transactions. You know, and one of our investors pretty much clearly said this. This was a guy who backed Braintree. I mean, he said, this is the fastest growing payments company I have ever seen, period. Right? And those things are, are possible in Africa because you're starting from you know, such, a, such a, a, back, a back seat. The high interest by startups to launch investments in the continent is also demanding that regulators stay on their feet. So for the innovators, uh, when they come to us with a product or when they think of a product, um, from their perspective, they're only looking at maybe the service that this thing is producing for the customer and maybe also their bottom line, how much money are they going to make and all those other things and maybe how they're going to fund it. and all Those are the considerations I think that uh, uh, let's say germane to the concerns of the um, of the innovator, um, but when they come to us, we do ask that question. Wait a second, uh, this is all very nice, but tell us about uh, how it affects the rest of the financial system. While Africa has made significant strides in ensuring growth of financial services, the cost of the same is now under sharp spotlight. Experts reckon that products must not only be easily accessible, but also affordable. If you look at the numbers today, 20% of remittance amount is spent on just the cost of remittance. And just imagine what kind of impact that has on, on the poorest person. We need to include those people to the global economy and enable them to be supported by their family ar around the world. We also need to enable them to contribute as well. They should be able to sell their crafts and their goods and everything that they do globally. When you're dealing with very low income customers, you do need to make things uh, affordable. We've got our hands a little bit tied. So, you know, we as a telecom operator uh, don't have the ability to really utilize the money which is sitting on deposits. At any one time, you know, we have probably about $700 million which is sitting on deposit. But we don't have any access to the money that that earns. And I think that would be a very effective way of trying to reduce the cost of transaction. But I agree with you that uh, the, the cost of transaction still needs, to, uh, still needs to go down. The next technology that is shaping the future of financial services in the continent is blockchain. While it can be applied in many other industries, the emergence of digital currencies promises to elevate it to a fast and cost-effective mode of accessing and exchanging capital 
in the coming days. The blockchain technology is widely expected to change the landscape of the global economy by revolutionizing the way companies and consumers interact with each other. So the blockchain currently that's on cryptocurrency is um, you know, a public ledger that records instantaneously um, records where we can now send and receive money anywhere in the world without the need of an intermediary. So the blockchain itself, you know, apart from cryptocurrency, can be used um, not only with cryptocurrency, but we're starting to see many other uses for the blockchain. Bitcoin and Ethereum, among other cryptocurrencies, have seen many Africans want to invest in digital currencies due to rapid price gains. However, experts point to a need for consumer education. It is a learning process and I would urge people to first understand what uh, they're getting themselves into firstly because what we've been seeing on the continent is that most of our people are, are, are driving you know, or running to, to into these things because of greed firstly. Um, they're looking at the spurts of the cryptocurrency growth rate and they're also you know, getting into things when they don't really understand it and that opens up evidence use for them to put money into schemes that have proved to be scams. When you think about blockchain, people, um, people think about using that for buying, but actually they use it for speculating more than for buying. Uh, we still have some issues around how you deal with uh, knowing your customer, how you deal with money laundering, how you deal with those issues. And so I think it's still early days, um, but it will continue to evolve and it will evolve, I think, pretty quickly. Banks on the continent are already exploring ways to incorporate blockchain in their business strategies. You know, some banks have started uh, using it, say, for overseas remittances. Uh, recently, there was a collaboration between uh, Emirates and BD Bank in Dubai and uh, ICI, ICICI Bank in India uh, for remittances. Uh, we've also seen it being used in terms of uh, invoice financing, in terms of letters of credit. Because the way the technology is designed, I mean, it just reduces transaction costs it's a very safe and secure uh, platform. Even though blockchain is largely regarded as safe, data security remains a concern. With anything, any new technology, um, hacking is, you know, especially in the online space, is a, a security concern. But as the you know, technology develops, what we're going to start to see is more development around the cybersecurity spaces. Um, generally, what happens with hackers is that they you know, find um, or ways or they make ways of the IoT devices participate with attacks. And in this way, we're starting to see um, you know, uh, cybersecurity firms now starting to counteract all of these um, attacks. Some central banks on the continent have also been reluctant to endorse its adoption in the formal banking sector. We as a central bank and actually I'm talking of now fraternity of central banks um, are much more cautious about these things. You start a technology with a back door that uh, only so and so somebody out there may have the key to. That's not something that we want to uh, put our entire financial stability on just the actions of one person who never told us that he had a backdoor key and then suddenly he decides that he can use this backdoor key. I have met multiple central banks in different parts. To some extent, they are absolutely on the ball in terms of what's happening in technology. Where it sort of uh, people are wary of is that it's application in the respective countries. So we are not yet very sure how this is panning out, whether it's in Kenya or it's in Zambia or in other markets. So they're at a different speed. So that's why we are, you know, the regulation is typically going to follow the development work which is happening. A famously quoted statistic on just how big the gap in financial inclusion in Africa is, is that by McKinsey and Company in 2010, which showed that up to 80% of the population lacks access to banks and microfinance institutions. Considering that fintech may not have been a big phenomenon seven years ago, technology is now making money more accessible as an enabler of day-to-day -day lives. And that's here for Africa this month. My name is Charles Gitonga and thank you for watching.